This training video is brought to you by K-Alliance. K-Alliance is the 21st century's educational corporation, specializing in the most comprehensive enterprise training solutions, ranging from e-learning to instructor-led training. Press play for success. After watching this video, be sure to become a Facebook fan to receive the latest updates, promotions, and course releases. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to preview the latest desktop, soft skills, and IT training videos. Once we've completed the planning phases, then we're ready to move on to the execution or the actual migration phase, migrating the file services. And there are a number of different processes and considerations we need to take into account when performing this migration. First of all, consider migrating offline file settings and file system management tasks that are scheduled to reoccur. Okay, so offline file settings, caching settings on the folders will need to be manually redone. Any file system management task like the uh, execution of certain quotas, certain disk reports and those kinds of things, you know, make sure that we have actually migrated those over, recreated them on the additional on the other side. Create an inventory, the uh, DFS namespaces as well as all the replicated folders. You know, this is something that uh, really, you could say it's in the planning or the execution. In any case, it needs to be done before the migration or as a part of the migration. The listing out the DFS namespaces, each folder in the logical hierarchy, each target, uh, and ensuring that everything is going to get properly replicated over and so that we know which ones we need to check, basically. Then export file server resource manager configuration, including the configuration files of each volume, the report configurations. You can do that using the Windows PowerShell commands that are a part of uh, the server migration tools. If shadow copy settings are, are modified, then they should be uh, migrated over as well. Okay, again, a, a function of the server migration tools. Local users and groups, uh, that's possible to migrate if, you're, if that's necessary. And it typically, again, if a machine is a member of a domain, a member server, you don't really need to do this. But in some cases, we've utilized local users and groups to limit access types on that specific server. You know, often that's done with database programs as well. So it's just something to think about. You, know, you can migrate those over using PowerShell if that's a requirement. Uh, the data can then be migrated. That migration is being performed using the server migration tools, but really the PowerShell commandlets. And once data is copied over to the destination server, uh, that server should obtain the computer name and IP address of the source through what's called identity migration. Now these are the individual steps and some of the configuration uh, that has to be, or considerations, that need to be taken into account. But again, the Windows Server migration tools are doing a lot of this for us. The next step would be the physical migration. Well, the physical migration involves actually actually moving the physical storage devices or the LUNs, the logical unit numbers, from source to destination server. Uh, and it provides numerous benefits to other, uh, other migration scenarios. So to be clear, we can go through the server migration tools and then I should have said or, not the next step, or we can perform the physical migration. Physical migration is much faster for larger amounts of data. Why? Because we're actually taking the storage and just putting it on the new server. We're not actually migrating or copying anything. All data on the disk is transferred. That includes mount points, any hard links, shadow copies are easily preserved because they're on the disk. So physical migration is definitely uh, advantageous. You know, there are some potential issues, the inability to migrate EFS because of the lack of private key information needed to decrypt those files. You, cannot, uh, do so, you can't do this with BitLocker either, um, as well as remote storage. So there are some limitations, but in many cases, just physical migration will be, uh, will be advantageous. Once the migration is complete, then we have the post-migration phase. In this phase, virtually all data and configurations are checked to make sure that we've properly copied everything over, and that's data and settings. So some of this may not be applicable depending on the type of migration that you've actually done, but if it's applicable, then all of the following things should be verified. Uh, data and shared folder migration, that the folders have actually moved over, that they are in fact accessible to clients, and that the ACLs have been preserved, the permissions are in place and in effect. Uh, DFS namespaces, 
We need to verify that the namespace is now active on the destination server, that the logical hierarchy is accessible going through each individual folder. Uh, we could turn on the access-based enumeration and ensure that that's working properly. We need to verify replication. Now, you can do so with the DFS management console as well as DFS command line utilities. You can also do so just by looking at Event Viewer you know, and ensuring uh, that, all the, that you don't have any warnings or error messages in there. With FSRM, it's opening up the file server resource manager on the destination machine, uh, seeing any report history and configuration that you might have, quota configuration, file screens, those kinds of things, just making sure that everything is migrated over, still in effect, unchanged, you know, in its settings. Client connectivity to the server, to all the files, that includes with DFS uh, as well as non-DFS, you know, and domain, domain members should be able to continue to have consistent access to this information. If it's local users and groups, then you can use Server Manager to verify the local SAM database and that the contents contain the users and groups that may have been migrated over through using uh, Windows PowerShell. Okay. Following verification, assuming that all this is, has gone off without a hitch uh, or after fixing any errors that we might have encountered, then the source server is retired and all the data can be deleted. If you want, you can retire the source server without deleting the data. Uh, that allows you to transition in a quicker fashion, but still, ha still have a, uh, a rollback capability. Okay. So, this has just been a high-level view of the actual steps that are going to be required to use the migration tools to migrate file services. Now, we're going to take a look at a demo so that we can see some of these things that we've been talking about. We'll walk through the process of migrating file and print services from Windows Server 2003 to Windows Server 2008.